Okay, so I, I see that we have um, converged to a fixed number of attendees. Uh, so let me pick it up here. Uh, my name is Berber Kramer, and I am standing in today um, for Javu Ku. Um, oh. So let me start by welcoming you all. Um, Javu, unfortunately, um, had another commitment at the moment, but he is joining uh, for the Q&A session, and we'll be moderating that. But until then, um, I will be standing in for him. Um, so let me start with um, um, a bit of an introduction to this topic. Um, agriculture insurance is increasingly an important safety net against production losses from weather and climate shocks. And index insurance, um, using geospatial data and real-time analytics has been one of the most important and maybe also more popular research topics in the community of practice here. And so in this end of the year um, uh, spatial webinar, uh, which is jointly organized between the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, and then the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, CCAPS, um, we will have four pioneering studies around using digital innovations for index-based agriculture insurance. Um, today, as panelists um, presenting some of this inspiring work, we will have um, Dr. Murali Krishnaguma from Ikrisat, who's calling in from uh, India. Then there's Dr. Giriraj Amarnath, um, who's with IMWI and calling in from Sri Lanka. And we have Dr. Aniruda Ghosh, um, who's with the Alliance and calling in from Siat, or from, from Nairobi, Kenya. And then there's also me, and I'm um, uh, with IFPRI, a senior research fellow, and I'm in Nairobi as well. Um, so with that, um, let me just not take up more time. Um, Dr. Murali, are you there and able to share your screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Then the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, yeah. So I hope it is visible now. Yeah, we can see yes. your screen. Thank uh, good you. Good morning, all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all of you. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Berber, for giving introduction about uh, crop insurance and uh, about us. And this is my presentation. Agriculture Resilience uh, Linking Insurance and Technology. This is actually, I'll give a little bit of background about uh, this project. Actually, this is supported by uh, Swiss, Swiss Agency for Development and Corporation, Cooperation, uh, along with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Pradhan Mantri Fadal Bhima Yojana project. Actually, MNCFC, they are supporting for this activity uh, to execute in India. And uh, actually, ST, uh, RESAR, this is the phase one, phase two, phase three, rice three project. Actually, rice one and rice two projects mainly uh, on rice for different countries they have implemented. But rice three, it is we are implementing dry land areas uh, using SAR technology, SAR based technology. Okay, uh, and Ikrisat, we are leading in this project, rice three project, uh, which is called RESAR project. And we have developed in this project, we have developed. Uh, 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 tools uh, for, uh, you know, rem uh, based on remote sensing based applications for dry land areas. And uh, my experience, some of my experiences I will be, uh, I'm going, I'm going to show you right now. Yeah, the background, as you all know, India, we are implementing uh, since long uh, crop insurance project, but 2016, uh, before 2016, there was uh, weather based crop insurance. But after 2016 and 17, they are implementing yield-based crop insurance. As you know, uh, you know mainly rice and wheat. Mainly, why? Because you know earlier weather-based crop insurance, and now it is uh, yield-based crop insurance because of uh, you know many uh, most of the area in India uh, in India irrigated condition. It uh, whether it is it is not related to the any kind of weather. So uh, that's the reason they are implementing uh, yield-based crop insurance for last from 2017 to till date. 
and yeah and also another part actually we are encouraging in indian government encouraging farmers to adopt uh, uh, you know um, it is directly linking to credit linking insurance actually whoever taking loans from the bank they are already assured um, uh, they have they must have to take uh, you know uh, crop insurance but not all the farmers only uh, you know some of the farmers they are enrolled into the uh, crop insurance who are taking uh, loans from the bank okay and major risks uh, they are covering uh, uh, yield losses and uh, prevented sowing uh, if it is uh, uh, crop sowing is delaying those areas also covering under uh, you know crop insurance and post harvest losses also it is covering especially you know just before harvesting some of the uh, natural calamities are happening and those also uh, covering in this uh, insurance scheme and also uh, some of the area some of the eastern part of you know india there are localized calamities that also they are covering in this crop insurance scheme if you want more information you can have a look at uh, uh, this link also pm fby link and you can get the more details about this one as i mentioned you know restructured weather based crop insurance scheme uh, from 2016 to 18 that is weather based now it is uh, yield based crop insurance from 2018 onwards uh, mncfc is implementing uh, all this with the uh, uh, support of various agencies and ecris had also part in that uh, project from 2018 to till date and main uh, for this project actually we are conducting uh, many cces that is for validation using technology technology based yield assessment we are doing at the gp level and uh, we are comparing with uh, uh, crop cutting experiments uh, information and finally we are concluding at gp level with the spatial distribution we are ma uh, mapping with the remote sensing technology you know so far actually 40 million farmers enrolled up to 2020 but the number is it is increasing even for uh, the present project uh, what i mentioned uh, uh, rice three project we are actually one of the activity uh, we are uh, we are giving more awareness to the farmers to increase the number of uh, uh, loan uh, you know uh, to enroll uh, pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana project phase 1 and phase uh, phase 2 mainly implemented for rice and uh, uh, mainly rice but phase 3 it is mainly we are implementing for dryland areas uh, dryland area mainly non cereal crops and now the same uh, this methodology is also we are adapting for a mncfc project and mncfc is implementing non cereal pro, uh, non cereal crops uh, for this rabi season onwards 2021 rabi season onwards we are also part in that project yeah this is the background given that background now um, i'll come into the our resar project actually the main the project goal is increasing adoption of the crop insurance crop risk management solutions by the farmers for increasing resilience to the climate related risks through by using remote sensing technology and crop science led advisories through uh, farmer collective uh, collectives we are giving to the advisories uh, through mobile applications and uh, strengthening the farming communities and ultimately it is resulted uh, to give the more awareness to the farmers uh, to reduce the risk here is the main five components we are uh, working here you can see the component one is mainly remote sensing based uh, crop monitoring uh, we are here we are uh, monitor um, we are uh, we are uh, uh, monitoring three um, we are doing three activities uh, one is uh, crop type mapping and the second one is uh, uh, crop stress mapping for every 15 days uh, various stresses mainly drought and submergence we, we are monitoring for entire uh, india and third one is uh, um, you know length of growing periods also start of season peak of season end of season based on this one this information we are providing to the insurance and reinsurance companies that is the component one and component 2 is application of crop models we are using various uh, crop models uh, mainly dsat and fsim model uh, for yield assessment at gp level by using remote sensing technology and the crop models and component 3 capacitating farmer collectives mainly uh, we are giving advisories to the farmers uh, um, some varieties 
based on uh, uh, weather conditions, we are providing some advisories to the farmers. And component four. <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> miso level insurance products we are generating that is with the support of uh, other agencies. And finally, the uh, fifth component is policy advocacy, mainstreaming remote sensing based risk assessment. These are the major five activities we are working on this project. Here you can see some of the examples. What <clears throat> from the component one, we are regularly monitoring uh, cropland areas. Uh, as I mentioned, the length of growing periods as well, and crop stress maps, and finally, crop type maps, specifically these crop type maps for uh, yield assessment. In the yield assessment, we are using this is the one of the important input parameters for the uh, for the yield assessment at GP level. For remote sensing, actually, we have developed a semi-automated techniques. Uh, uh, by uh, partially, we are using uh, Google Earth engine, and uh, the final crop type map uh, by using spectral matching techniques. Uh, uh, we are generating specific crop type and length of growing periods generating from this kind of methodology. I'm not going much detailed way here, but uh, you can see here. We actually, we are generating for various crops. If you see here, entire South Asia, we generated uh, uh, crop signatures for uh, all major crops in India. This is the, uh, this is the ideal spectra signatures for uh, uh, all major crops in India. Okay. And uh, uh, based on this one, uh, by using spectral matching technique, actually we used uh, supervised and unsupervised classifications, mainly unsupervised classification. Initially we are running a uh, uh, number of classes, 100 to 200 classes. And based on that class signatures and uh, uh, ideal spectra signatures by using spectral matching technique, we are identifying exact crop boundaries. You can see here the major crops you can see in South Asia rice, all major crops we identified here. And that is the first product. And second one is the length of growing period, which is very important. Uh, we generated by using Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Here, the distribution I'm showing here for a uh, uh, start of season, peak of season, end of season. But every 15 days, we are monitoring this one. And the third product is, uh, you know, crop stress monitoring, which is very important. Actually, this product we are generating for every uh, 15 days and this we are circulating widely. Insurance and reinsurance companies, they are also using this product uh, for their uh, alternative, uh, you know, uh, based on this information, they are, uh, they are giving instructions to the farmers to, um, uh, to reduce the risk. Okay, not only you know the small area actually the, we are producing for uh, uh, entire south asia but uh, state uh, sub district wise we are generating statistics and percentages this information we are providing to insurance and reinsurance companies that is the first component the spatial product and second one um, crop yield assessment uh, by using technology we used uh, dsat and epsi models mainly dsat model for uh, uh, rice and uh, wheat wheat here, uh, the input parameters are climate data, mainly climate data, we are using NASA power data and also uh, some districts so where we are support, we are getting support from uh, MNCFC, uh, we use AWS data, automated weather station data, which is station data. For a district, it is uh, eight to 10, uh, 10 locations we are identifying. That information we are feeding to the our crop models. And soil data, NBSS LUP, that in, uh, we digitized uh, high resolution maps, that information we are feeding to the model, actually. And management practices while conducting ground information, we are collecting uh, management data from the farmers, getting uh, irrigation, agronomical practices, and uh, uh, mainly varieties, crop varieties, all this information we are feeding to the model. And finally, we are getting uh, we, uh, mainly five products, the leaf area index, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, biomass, and yield. Actually, this is all, um, the modeled output is at a location base. Actually, from remote sensing, leaf area index, that is our proxy. 
and based on leaf area index we are generating spatial maps like this okay this is the and also the information what we generated from the location wise that we compared with the um a predicted yield and observed yield here you can see here this is for the groundnut crop in jhansi district of course there was a pretty good correlation nearly 62% but uh, uh, still we are improving our uh, model results this is depending upon uh, uh, you know crop varieties we are uh, actually we don't have um, the most of the varieties in entire district that's the reason there is a, some gaps are there still we are improving that one to improve our crop models and the finally the what i showed in the previously that is at the point location and now we are we are providing for entire larger area uh, gp level yield assessment here you can see uh, the yield variability as yield variability maps the leaf area index actually we are comparing of course generating from the remote sensing but we are uh, significantly you know um, 100 to 150 samples we are collecting for one district as a pilot and that we are comparing with the uh, remote sensing output and we are standardizing that methodology as well and that is the second component third one third component is risk mitigation crop advisories we are uh, we developed a, some uh, a, you know few mobile applications we are giving advisories as well that information actually mainly we are providing uh, rainfall forecast so a sowing window uh, which is so uh, and a location based suitable crop and varieties as well and also it is uh, uh, and also we are giving some recommendations uh, uh, disease pest and disease management uh, that information also we are providing to the uh, through mobile applications and fertilizer applications uh, every 15 days we are providing this information as well through in this component and the fourth component is uh, the farmer service. Actually, we are giving, uh, we are uh, uh, through mobile applications and we are web portals also we have developed through, uh, through mobile, uh, mobile platform. We are integrating remote sensing data and the field based information also we are feeding to the um, um, farmers and also extension officers and uh, uh, FP was farmer producer organizations also we are providing this information and finally outreach actually we are uh, this information we are disseminating very widely uh, as I mentioned uh, insurance and reinsurance companies mainly and also our partners as well local, uh, national partners as well we are feeding this information actually this is uh, a one way and another way we are uh, strength, we are capacitating farmers and we are, uh, you know, the, our main target is to increase uh, uh, non uh, you know, uh, this is mainly non loni farmers and, uh, and widely we are, uh, uh, you know, disseminating this information to the farmers and uh, they are also actively coming up and nearly more than uh, 30, 35,000 farmers were enrolled in this project for last uh, up to 2020 only. Due to the COVID, we have some, uh, you know, due to the COVID, we are not able to disseminate uh, effectively, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhat we, we will develop in coming days, we will improve. And that is one way. And another way, we are also, uh, agriculture water management interventions, we are implementing uh, uh, some of the locations. And during, uh, due to this one also, this is uh, one of the outreach. And, uh, you know, uh, you can see February 2019 and February 2020. And some of the small village, you know, some of the villages, they have adopted, they have increased the cropping intensity as well. Actually, this is another project. It is which is linking to the Resar project. And if you see in this small area, actually before 2019, there was only uh, 2.8 hectares only, but now it is uh, 36.7 hectares. This is a small area, but this kind of watershed interventions we are is happening for larger district wise as well. Actually, this is a very less investment compared to, you know, as you all know, the crop insurance, it is nearly 20,000 crores. They are, uh, you, uh, you know, they are spending on this one. But even with, if uh, 5 to 10% of uh, money, if, if we spend on natural resource management, it will be the very uh, effective way. It will be, we can increase uh, crop productivity as well and uh, minimize the risk as well in dryland areas, especially. 
Okay, the project achievement actually in this project, uh, we uh, we have already you know uh, standardized uh, uh, monitoring crop plants and crop stress mapping by using remote sensing technology with the machine learning algorithms. And crop yield assessment uh, still we are improving our uh, models. So far we uh, we achieved only seventy to eighty percent only, but still we are improving our models to increase the accuracy as well with the real uh, with the uh, ground information. And as I mentioned, non-loney farmers enrollment. Actually, loney farmers directly, you know, they are, uh, uh, you know, um, directly bank, they are initiating, they are directly cutting from their uh, uh, loans. But non-loney farmers, it is increased in this project to more than 30,000 farmers, but still it is increasing much more. And outreach, actually, we are implemented, we have implemented for only for India, but now it is uh, adapted for other countries as well. Uh, example, we are closely working with the ADB for Pakistan and other countries as well. Okay, learnings so far, you know, um, especially what we have developed the uh, remote sensing technology for monitoring crop plants and uh, crop stress. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, semi automated technique, uh, including machine learning algorithm, is a good approach to monitor up to date uh, uh, crops and the crop modeling of course soil moisture there are some limitations are there but still we are improving uh, uh, our models but uh, of course right now we are using leaf area index only but soil moisture also one of the appropriate indicator uh, to uh, map out uh, you know gp level yield assessment and as i mentioned uh, uh, you know, um, natural resource management, that is also one of the important activity uh, to uh, increase the crop intensity to minimize uh, risk uh, and, uh, through NRM technologies. Okay, this is the acknowledgements and we would like to thank to uh, STC team uh, where we got support from for this project, this activity. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the RESAR project team MNCFC, Dr. Shivindu Ray, Dr. VM Choudhury, Dr. Sunil Dubey and team. IRICS who are supporting us uh, from crop insurance sector, uh, Dr. Kulli Rao and team, and USGS, Dr. Prasad and others. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Murali. Um, I forgot mentioning that Dr. Murali is um, uh, a geospatial and big data scientist and the head of the remote sensing and geographic information system unit with ICRISAT. Um, he has over 22 years experience in natural resource management um, and remote sensing and geographic information systems and then working on their application to agricultural wetlands, river basin management, water resources, forests, sustainable development and environmental studies, land suitability analysis and watershed prioritization. So for those here in the webinar who are interested in exchanging, please do get in touch with Dr. Murali. Um, and I see that there's already uh, one question to that extent. Now with that, let's turn to our second presentation for today, which is on loss flood insurance, um, evidence and potential at the global scale by Dr. Girash Amana from IMWI. Um, Girash is a principal researcher for disaster risk management and climate resilience and research group leader for water risks and disasters at IMWI. Um, and his expertise includes water risk management, floods and droughts, satellite based monitoring and early warning, emergency response, climate risk insurance, which is why we're here today, big data disaster risk reduction, climate and food security, and natural resource management. Um, so Girash, the floor is yours. Um, and I think Dr. Morali, if you can stop sharing your screen, then Girash will be able to pull up his slides. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, yeah, I believe now I can share the screen now. Yes. So let me know, uh, you can all see the screen now. It is, yes, it's showing not yet in presentation mode. Yeah, Pardon? now we can see your video, but perfect. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, and I do have some bandwidth problem. I'll come back again uh, by sharing the video later. Yeah, so uh, I think it was excellent presentation from uh, Gumpa Murli to uh, pitch this presentation on crop insurance. 
um, we will speak more on the perspective of what we do on um, the aspect of excess water, that is flood insurance. So I defined this in terms of a title called underwater because we want to really uh, understand the farmer's uh, crop damages and what evidences we have and how potentially we can scale because we are also in the phase of uh, finishing the CGR research program on CCAF and also the CGR research program from water, land and ecosystem. It's a great opportunity to present uh, particularly this uh, innovations, what we have done. So thanks to Java and also Barber for uh, facilitating this important session. And this presentation is an input coming from three researchers from me, and I will be speaking on behalf of all the researchers. So uh, what I would speak today is on uh, why flood risk information is critical for uh, risk insurance product. While we talk about very generic weather index insurance products uh, in India and elsewhere, but it is also important to look at specific peril as uh, climate is quite complex and uh, technologies and risk modelings are quite um, uh, difficult to understand and quantify. So understanding any individual peril is quite important. And often uh, having a reliable damage estimation uh, for defining an index insurance parameter is also challenging. And what is our concept and where we implemented and some of our evidences and where we are um, uh, in our next leg of looking at the global aspect of uh, uh, flood insurance potential at a global scale. While these uh, global scale products are still not validated, it is, um, will be revised and updated in early next year. So uh, I think uh, first to uh, pitch on this, uh, why climate risk insurance is quite important while many of the participants are quite familiar on that. I think we know despite doing all the risk management strategy uh, structural and non-structural, uh, providing better seed, etc. Climate invariably is going to affect in terms of the availability of uh, um, the inputs or for matter that also exhibit in terms of the um, uneven distribution of rainfall, whether that leads to drought and flood. And over years, we have seen that uh, exponential reporting of the uh, natural disaster event, particularly the flood, and we do see there is a significant protection gap across particularly the developing countries. On the other hand, uh, UN and many global agencies clearly pointed out that there is a significant adaptation gap. We talk about uh, investments in um, poor and developing countries, and uh, that talks about less than 5% of the global budget when it comes to adaptation. So uh, we can then summarize risk insurance in terms of the portfolio where the reinsurer the countries they are investing is still a very tiny when it comes to risk management uh, portfolio. So as long as these protection gaps are not looked closely, we are going to see with climate change over years, there is a significant protection gap is expected while reinsurer are also not tend to take a lot of risk in terms of structuring and developing innovative product in high uh, climate risk areas or flood prone areas. And there is also a UN study that says if there is 1% increase in a quality insurance product, we could have a disaster recovery over 22%. So these estimates really proves that why and how risk insurance are certainly important while I just summarize those three points. Now, while it looks uh, in terms of problem statement, there is other significant problem is about lack of data because often we look at, uh, uh, Gumpa Murli was talking about crop cutting experiment. I know how much the government spends in terms of millions of rupees just for uh, cutting the crop and knowing what is the yield. And then uh, by the time the farmers are moving into several months from now and the compensations are not even reliable to be uh, in terms of the sum insured or in terms of the input costs the farmers are generally uh, practicing in that. And despite many of those farmers are non loanee farmers, and their MFIs, their uh, practice of uh, uh, financial institutions are quite weak. So while we see a lot of bottleneck there, there is also the risk modeling, as I said, is still very primitive. And that's where in recent years, uh, most of the institutions have started setting up weather stations to come up with a parametric insurance product. And now I would say in South Asia and elsewhere, a lot of uh, automatic weather stations have a significant growth. But again, there are still some bias in terms of available data. That's why even still robust data is very important. That's where modeling data, 
your uh, automatic weather station, you need to blend various data. So I, I, I would say that by 2021, we can say certainly there is a significant growth in data development, whether it is uh, digital data coming from Earth Engine or from other uh, modeling tools that help today reinsurer to have significant amount of data sets. Right? So that's the bottleneck where we see, and there is a quite a significant uh, pathways in uh, growth of the risk insurance program. Now, uh, from there we see here, uh, we have been collating over uh, 100 years of uh, flood records. Uh, this is a snapshot for uh, Asia. We can uh, clearly say that over 6,000 global records we have uh, at International Water Management Institute from various sources. It really talks about over 45 plus of those events reported in Asia. This really shows a uh, typical weather index insurance alone cannot uh, work very well. And over years, we have seen China and India over uh, just about 400 to 500 events have reported, right? So we know uh, these crop insurance are very important. Countries like China, India, and Vietnam, and other countries as it is listed here. And this really qualifies that risk insurance and technology development are critical for a government to de-risk uh, the kind of uh, uh, financial risk they are all going forward. And often, uh, Traditionally, there is always a relief-based financial mechanism that again uh, links to old banks and uh, um, popularity of election mandate where the governments are generally tend to provide relief versus the risk insurance. But significantly, this is changing in terms of the behavioral context of the policymakers. And now we have uh, altogether these grids have been analyzed over a coarser grid of 100 kilometer global level. And we have now mapped over 90% of all grid cells, uh, how uh, event number of events have happened, how, what is the duration of the flood. And we can say annually over these regions, roughly about 20 billion US dollar and an annual of over 30 million people are expected to be affected. And over 500,000 square kilometer of crop lands are getting affected. So these snapshots are really important to look at how and where the uh, structural products need to be developed in countries like Asia. Now, it's not just uh, speaking about global picture. So we do have mapping at every eight day flood extent. We look at recurrent and seasonal flooding. The hydrograph like uh, the graph, what you see is clearly showing the peak flood extent uh, coming from every day, every eight day flood extent. And you can also see the animation where seasonal flood extents can be captured. So we have now a good capability from CGR, which can speak on the uh, grid data at a very fine scale resolution and producing the data is certainly helpful to design a good product. And uh, as you zoom in for uh, Indus Basin, we could also construct a very close view of flood duration map, which can really see uh, when and which month the flood durations are very severe. And this also really uh, uh, captures that the importance of flood risk damages on a particular stage of the crop as well. So you could certainly relate with the stage of the crop, the duration of the flooding, and you can certainly estimate a flood damage. That's the next part of the slide I will be speaking on. So uh, then looking at always flood is not just about agriculture, it's also about people. You could also look at livelihood related product, which I'll give an example. Uh, countries like South Asia, we are talking about 250 million people are exposed to flood on an annual basis, uh, depending on the scale and return period of the flood event. Right? So these statistics and assessment and characteristics are good enough to look at how we really come with a, a tangible data for designing a product. Now, these data sets are available in water data portal of IWMI. Currently, it's in maintenance. Uh, you may not get all this data, but if there are interest in collaboration, we'd be happy to uh, look forward to that. Now, uh, on the flood risk damage, uh, uh, the team is looking at how we can really estimate a flood risk damage. So what we need is some kind of observed data, the depth, duration, damage curve, et cetera, in one part of the uh, modeling system. The other set of work, we generally look at village level, uh, these products at a depth and duration. And once you have, and basically you will have to come up with the input cost, how generally farmers are practicing at a farm unit, whether it's a 0.1 hectare or a one hectare, depending on the unit. And then these statistics are generally provided by the local department. And these estimates are highly reliable just before the start of the season. And then we use also like Earth Engine and many other tools 
to come up with the SAR based agriculture map, dynamic flood damage map, in season stage wise crop loss, etc. And that really can characterize the village level flood risk damages for specific crop types. It could be largely for Karif season in states like Bihar, it's a rice crop. Now, what does it do? Generally, I would not go more detail on that, but eventually, this is basically you come with a known hazard area and uh, develop a damage function curve and uh, that will directly relate to the economic loss, right? So we are able to do collecting absorbed water level, remote sensing derived agriculture extent as I spoken uh, and stages of crop and the type of flood is very important. Once we have these seven steps are done, you would come with the stage seven where you can calculate a loss of the flood risk at a specific stage. Sometimes what happened, uh, insurance companies generally wait for the end of the season. But if the flood has happened at the early stage of the crop, there is no such uh, uh, crop insurance currently in India provides that opportunity. Now, if we can trigger and fine tune a better policies here, if there is an early season of flooding, farmers uh, uh, got really the uh, early stage of crop, you have a trigger where you could give a payout. But generally, there is not much data is available also with the, those institutions. So. Uh, developing such models, developing such and data at a country level can certainly help farmers to plan early season uh, sowing of the next crop season or they could able to replant and the insurance company should able to provide quick compensation. Currently, the problem is these are very static principles of crop season and crop uh, harvesting period, etc. So farmers generally have to wait for more than nine months if the season of flooding started even at month of June. So. Uh, we need to look at uh, improvement in the insurance product and the term period, etc. Now, uh, I would uh, skip this part, but basically we do have similar what uh, uh, Murli was speaking from ICRISAT on various uh, remote sensing uh, instruments to map the crop type, the flood extent, uh, the ground level data, and you could come with different stages of the flooding and what could be the cost of those. We have already all those works have been done. And finally, these maps are going to tell us at each day, village level, you could uh, quickly come with the earth engine kind of a tool, estimate at a village level. For example, the villages, what you see in uh, one of the river in uh, Bakhmati, where you can say about 20 million rupees are required for 26 villages where the damage is reported at, a, uh, at more of a flowering stage or in the mature stage of the crop, right? So, you could estimate very quickly with our tool like uh, what we developed and the purpose is how insurance companies could de-risk these kind of a flood prone areas as well. They generally look at low and uh, potential risk where the government would take more risk from their side. So there are a lot more work need to be done from the insurance sectors as well. So moving on to the index-based flood insurance, in brief, uh, all the modeling capabilities, the loss assessment, etc., has been used. And basically it comes with the flood depth, duration and inundation. These are the three parameters. So these are the spots we have tested with various partners, insurance company, uh, uh, private sector, SMEs, World Food Program, NGOs, etc. There are more than 15 partners have worked with us in this index-based flood insurance, more available in this YouTube. But in summary, what does it, this offers is basically, we have tested over 7,000 plus household. Insurance companies have provided over 150,000 US dollar. And now the insurance companies are also scaling countries like Bangladesh and India in Uttar Pradesh over 125,000 household. So this really proves how simple the concept could be and how there is a buy-in from MFI and insurance companies are there. And these technologies are also proven and certified by the group of Earth Observation on recognition to one of the uh, 2020 SDG awards. Now, I would go very briefly to highlight an example of UN World Food Program. They use our uh, technology and the product and they have designed this for casual labors in Bangladesh. And these are rolled out over 4,000 to 5,000 households. And they really integrate this under the resilient uh, livelihood program. So we know how this data is very important uh, for the insurance company and also for World Food Program when it comes to safeguarding safety net program. So this is one example where WFP partners with us on this risk insurance program. So this is again a proof of how various partners in Bangladesh are working there and we have provided during time of pandemic over 5.4 million claim directly in mobile accounts to all those farmers and 
and the technology is again using multiple remote sensing uh, data sets. Now, last leg is just to highlight uh, scaling flood insurance potential. Uh, as I said, we don't want to limit ourselves these interventions to specific uh, pilots. How do we uh, empower to uh, risk insurance program globally? So what we have done is so far, this is a work in progress. We look at various global data now, and this is a, a GDP population, flood hazard, land use, and what basically we have used some statistical method to come up with the risk potential at global scale. And it tends to be that the IBFI, if uh, countries are quite serious to ensure uh, flood peril, it's, it could potentially able to cover over 17 million hectares of croplands um, or the flood prone region. And of which uh, Asia covers about 13 million hectares. That's really the 70% of the size of flooding we are talking about in Asia. And in terms of IBFI potential within Asia, it's about India, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand are prone to flood, and these flood insurance potential are uh, good examples for them. Now, what does Hiras, this... We are sorry to interrupt. Um, we're past time, so it would be great if you can wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, this is my last slide. So I'm just saying uh, from the global flood insurance, this is a, a nested approach to look at states like Bihar in India, uh, eastern part of India. If you take those flood insurance product and look at a, a premium structure and what could be the loss. Uh, what we are looking at somewhere about 9 to 13% of the insurance premium with an input cost of over 270 to 500 US dollar for a per hectare crop land. If uh, a government of Bihar or government of India is taking up this product, they may need to insure over 85 million US dollar. That's a, a overall premium they would need to collect for these uh, state like Bihar. And this eventually could cover 3 million hectare and over 5 million household. This is the size of the structure we could develop. And again, we have more details on how you define flood duration for 8 to 11 days. And at different stages of the uh, crop and the damages, you could also give a compensation directly. So there is, as I said, this is work in progress, I would say. And so in summary, I think these technologies and tools are quite uh, helpful. Uh, I think in terms of scaling these models in the coming years. And so we have uh, a quite number of reading materials. I will pass on the slides later. You could read more about these interventions uh, on uh, from the International Water Management Institute. Thank you again, Barbara, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Girash. This was really interesting. Um, now with that, we're moving to our third presentation, which is by Dr. Aniruda Ghosh. Ani is a data scientist with the Alliance of Biodiversity International at CIAT Nairobi, in, in Nairobi. Um, his research focuses on using novel techniques to monitor agricultural systems to better understand the risk associated with different types of shocks and support the development of adaptation and mitigation strategies, including informational and financial services. And today, Ani is going to talk about designing the perfect index insurance contract. So, Ani, over to you. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, can you hear me? See me? We can hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, the screen, can you see me? See my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to put it into presentation mode. Yes, uh, I, I would like to apologize for the um, audience because I'm the third Indian male speaking today on insurance, we definitely know that India is quite important, uh, but you know, it shouldn't be that three Indian males is needed to speak about it. Uh, so today my talk is about designing the perfect index insurance contract. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, uh, it's a rhetorical question that I wanted to ask uh, and uh, mostly what I want to discuss. Uh, can we do that? So, and thank you uh, to Murli and uh, Kiraj to, you know, because they give a lot of the background around the index insurance and the role of remote sensing in it. So I'll try to keep my talk short and just discuss on two important uh, topics. One is the, uh, you know, the, the issue with the high quality ground data uh, that is needed for designing the insurance contract. And then the second topic I wanted to discuss today is the quality of insurance contract. Uh, so, now, the quality of ground data, uh, because we have the special uh, data science community, you know, we, we all acknowledge that it's really important to have really good quality ground data to develop any model. Uh, so, 
it is quite common in remote sensing. We need the data for crop type, mapping, crop yield prediction, crop loss prediction, and all those. Now, the challenge with the insurance program is whenever there is a new company, new program that is going to start, we we'll start looking for, you know, this kind of insurance products, right? Uh, sorry, the data sets. Uh, what has been the historical yield? What uh, what are the loss years? Uh, when you know what what is the amount of loss? What caused the loss? Right? Whether it was a flood, whether it was drought, or pests and diseases. And most of the time, what we have found so far, you know, and my experience is not that long. You know, I've been working in this insurance uh, insurance projects for last couple of years. That hardly there is any data set exists, and always you have to start with some sort of recall survey, and that would depend on farmers, you know. Uh, ability to remember fact uh, what happened and that is always a problematic because uh, most of that's costly first of all and second is that it's not so reliable uh, so i'll just give you uh, a, a few examples of why that this is you know why this kind of quality data from the ground is really important and how this can impact uh, the insurance contracts uh, so this is one example from Tanzania, and on the left hand you see a field uh, which is doing really good, a maize field, and this is the corresponding data set from the planet uh, captured around the same time. It's a three meter resolution, and you can see this is the dream of a remote sensing person, right? Okay, it's a homogeneous field, it looks really nice, and also it matches with the uh, ground photograph. And if this is the next example, somewhere nearby the area that we just saw, uh, this is another field. The field looks yellow. Uh, the field looks, you know, in the false color composite where red is good. It looks mixed. And when you look at the field photograph, we see, you know, the density of the maize plants are not so uh, high. Uh, and there is a lot of weed which can contribute to the greenness. And, you know, greenness is one of the index that we want to capture in the uh, in that uh, index, in the uh, model that helps us to estimate the yield or yield loss. And if you can see, there are a couple of other, you know, trees that are present in the field. Uh, so although we are talking about a very small field with the help of this kind of new data set, which is, you know, here is planet, we can still see there, there are, you know, a bunch of black, black uh, big trees, canopies over uh, within the field and also some part of the house that came in. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, the kind of trouble the remote sensing system will have to estimate I know the yield in this kind of smallholder field, and this is different in different countries. In uh, and this was an example from Tanzania. I have seen some examples from Kenya, Ghana. They are all different. Maybe it is different from India, where you know uh, the fields are more homogeneously cropped. So this is why we need to know not only what is the production uh, history, but also you know this kind of different practices, right? Uh, and I, I, I'm sh I think Barbara was going to speak more about the importance of the picture-based uh, evidences. So I'll, I'm going to skip on that. So now, why is this yield information needed? So one of the things that uh, has been mentioned in the previous two talks is the uh, insurance developed at some level, at some administrative level. So Murli talked about GP, I believe that was a gram panchayat level, which is basically the village level, and also Ginraj spoke at the village level. Uh, but uh, ideally, you know, uh, if, if you think about it, uh, there, there should be a different, that there should be another different uh, concern that we should we need to address. So, uh, for example, it's great we do it village level because it is much easier to manage the programs. But you know, it might happen that there are too many villages, so that comes with a lot of overhead in uh, you know managing the, the different portfolios for different villages. So, uh, we would ideally like to have a homogeneous um, homogeneous area which can be composed of you know multiple villages or in case of you know, um, it, places where it is really heterogeneous, it could also have two zones within the villages, but the homogeneous area should, you know, depict the, some sort of homogeneity in the yield, the historical yield, which basically takes care of the production environment as well as the investment and practices that the farmers adopt. So, uh, you know, this, this design of insurance zones uh, always remain quite a bit uh, difficult if we lack this kind of historical information. That's one of the important, uh, one of the important aspect. And then the other one is, uh, if we don't have this kind of ground information, then uh, the other challenge we face is what kind of insurance risk, what kind of peril are we trying to uh, insure here? So this is one example from Northern Ghana, and you know this is time series Mortis data for last 20 years, and it's the, it shows the season, uh, and we can, and we only had you know crop data for four years. And we couldn't see any such, uh, you know, signal, strong signal in the modis NDVI that could explain some of the 
uh, you know, uh, yield losses that we are, uh, that the farmers were reporting. And when we did a follow-up survey, a recall survey, it turned out that it was due to, you know, uh, fall army worm, which is very hard to detect in a kind of, this kind of remote sensing information, uh, remote sensing index. Uh, so we really need to have you know, good uh, detailed information of the ground to design uh, our insurance contract. So these are some of the issues I just wanted to you know, briefly at, uh, discuss or mention. Uh, if you are someone who is interested in insurance and want to start your, you know, want to support some of the insurance uh, activities. And the next topic that I want to talk about, it took me, it took even me, me uh, you know, quite a bit of time uh, to convince myself that it is even important. Right, so th this is a, a topic, uh, you know, it's called the quality. Uh, so we, we will discuss about the quality of index insurance contract, right? Uh, so I'm a remote, I have a background in remote sensing and, you know, since PhD for the last 20, 10, 12 years, all I knew about the quality of the product is R squared RMC. Then a couple of years back, when I, when I started working with uh, a group of economists uh, from UC Davis, uh, they gave, uh, the, they give this idea about does you know this R squared RMC in remote sensing, uh, how does that translate to you know economic well-being of the farmer? Does it mean that if you have a high R squared RMC, like for example, one of the speakers was mentioning, you know, 70%, uh, uh, sorry, 0.7 R squared, uh, like does it mean that you know the farmers is the farmer is expected to get you know 70% of uh, the loss covered, right? So how does it translate? And it, it turns out that, you know, it took me a long time to, you know, convince myself that this is something worth investigating uh, from the remote sensing point of view, because all we want is, again, R squared or anything, we want the high numbers. So I realized that there is a gap between the remote sensing and economic perspective. Uh, when we are talking about the quality. And we published a paper recently, I have given the link. If you are interested, you can uh, please have a look, but I will briefly talk about uh, how we uh, you know, implemented this framework. So we introduced a, a, a new measure called relative insurance benefit, which is basically says, you know, if you have an insurance contract and if you uh, have a, you know, perfectly uh, good insurance contract. So perfectly good, when I say perfectly good, it means that, you know, whatever loss the farmers are experiencing, it will be compensated for. Uh, and then we have a uh, insurance contract, which is non-perfect, which, you know, which generally we have. So we want to get a, you know, uh, ratio of all this. So what happens is if, if you if your insurance contract is really good, it's perfect, then you'll have a value greater than zero and you know uh, the the farmers will have farmers will benefit from the product. Uh, if your uh, relative insurance benefit is zero, there will be no benefit. And if uh, it's less than zero, then the farmers are worse off than having no insurance because you know they are paying probably uh, you know uh, some currency uh, to get as, as a form of premium to get insured. So we tested this RIV framework uh, for the it takes this livestock insurance product that is uh, that that is available that was available in northern Kenya. I think it's still going on. One of the reasons we took it because you know uh, the data set was uh, publicly available. The data set that uh, the research group who started AB program uh, uh, and and did the survey over multiple years they made it. Uh, you're very easily accessible. So that's one of the benefit that uh, one of the benefit of having an uh, open data set, uh, and we could test this kind of hypothetical framework. So you know th th this is this is uh, this is the graph of predictive skill of the different indices that we tested. So we tested MODIS NDVI, uh, you know that was average across the growing season in long run and short run. We computed a you know, transport version of that. Uh, we also use the rainfall uh, based indices. Uh, in, in some way, we were trying to mimic the uh, IBLI program, uh, how it is done, and also introduce some of the other indices like the rainfall. But what we wanted to find out is, you know, if an index, uh, if any index performs really well in terms of predicting the mortality of the livestock, uh, does it mean that it's a, you know, really great, it's a good, it, it, is, it is going to be good in terms of well being of the farmers? So, you know, we, we tested some simple linear regression methods and also some segmented regression methods, uh, you know, using the data set that we had. Uh, and in the next slide, I'm going to show you about, you know, the comparison between the predictive skill and the RID. Uh, so, for example, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we, so, so in, this, in this plot, we have two 
uh, different indices. So both of them has the same RMC, so same R square value, but very different RIBs. And we can uh, try to look into why this is happening. So, you know, both of them has an R square of 0 0.41, but the plot on the left, it has an RIB of 0 0.41 while on the plot on the right, it has an RIB of 0 0.5, which is you know, much preferred uh, from the uh, farmer's perspective. Uh, the reason is, uh, you can see there is this red triangles on the left hand. There, there are some considered red, tri red triangles. And red triangles means uh, it represents the severe false negatives. That means that you know, if you have, a, uh, the farmers have suffered a lot of loss, but the insurance has failed to cover it. But if you look at the uh, plot on the right, you will see that there are only one uh, severe false negative. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we have you know, a really high RIB, sorry, comparatively high RIB for the uh, index design on the right, which is based on the uh, you know, log transfer of MOTIS uh, NDVI uh, than the other one on the left, which is based on the, uh, I'm trying to find out, yeah, the rainfall rainfall indicator. So uh, now, how do we use it? So, you know, we, okay, we got a new RIB, new indicator, but uh, how do we move from uh, R square to RMSC, R square RMSC to RIB? So, in a recent paper, uh, so as a component to this uh, paper, we released an R implementation or guide for that. So you can go to this website and see a step by step process of how we implemented the entire uh, framework. Uh, and then how we can arrive from, you know, some ground data set, some uh, MODIS and rainfall, how we can access the MODIS, uh, you know, NDVI and rainfall data set and transform that to different index and, you know, you compute the RIB for different uh, contracts. Uh, so there the associated data set and the guide is available uh, in, in the link I have given on the right. And also in one of the other papers, we describe a little bit more about the technological advances uh, and how uh, that can be used for, you know, how that is help, helping in developing the field of uh, remote, you know, index insurance. Uh, and within that paper, we also describe uh, some uh, framework, how uh, you can use, uh, the, how, how, what are the different steps in, in what is the different steps involved in, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, what are the different steps involved in uh, reaching from uh, historical ground data and remote sensing to, you know, this kind of, uh, performance measurement. So this is my last slide. So uh, in summary, you know, what do we need to do? Uh, so we, we had a few uh, stakeholder engagement over the last um, a few weeks in Kenya and uh, it, it, all the stakeholders, they kind of uh, you know, led to this uh, requirement that there should be some sort of data sharing culture between different you know, uh, government agencies, agro-service providers who are mostly from the private sector, uh, because that will help the insurance industry to grow and also, you know, develop some sort of uh, a better product. And then the other uh, activity that I, the other activity I'd like to emphasize here is we need to include this kind of quality evaluation process as part of the insurance contract design program, because oftentimes what happens is our remote sensing uh, uh, indices, they are really good at predicting the higher, uh, production higher yield and then what happens is uh, it is uh, biased towards uh, you know predicting the higher values where the insurance has less benefit than compared to the lower values where you know the farmers are more suffering uh, farm, uh, because of the losses so we need to include some uh, some other some sort of quality evaluation and how we are trying to do it so this is our current uh, insurance portfolio program in the eastern and southern africa uh, region and within each of these in, uh, projects what we are trying to do is you know develop this culture of data sharing as well as you know, uh, mainstreaming this quality evaluation activities uh, so I, i'd you know i'd be happy to so my email is here and i'd be happy to discuss more about it if you have any questions with that uh, and with that um, I did, yeah, I in my presentation and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay, thanks, Ani. Um, yeah, I think we will move on to the next speaker right away and then uh, we will come back for our Q&A. Okay, so our final 
speaker of the day uh, is none other than Barbara Kramer, uh, who has been helping us to moderate the session. Uh, Barbara is a senior research fellow with IPRI. Uh, her research focuses on financial inclusion and resilience, and in particular on innovation in agricultural insurance and seed systems that can help smallholder farmers adapt to climate change. Uh, she, she currently leads a research program that aims to strengthen agriculture insurance and finance in Ethiopia, India, and Kenya through picture-based crop insurance using smartphone images or targeted crops to monitor crop health and management. Today, she's going to present us eyes on the ground using smartphone images and machine learning for crop monitoring. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jawu, and also thanks to the other presenters for kind of setting the scene and presenting such interesting work. Um, and uh, everybody, it's it's uh, yeah great um, that despite getting so close to the holidays that you're still here online with us. Um, so um, I'm going to present work from Kenya. This is joined with Kuhn Hufkens, who's with Ghent University, Lillian Waitaka, who is with Acre Africa, um, which is a um, uh, service provider in the agricultural value chain in uh, Kenya. Um, and then uh, Sanjay Mansabdar and his team from Dwara e-Registry, which is um, an agricultural um, tech, fintech uh, startup in India. Um, and this work is funded by the Lacuna Fund, um, NVO Votro, and Cultivate Africa's Future Phase 2. Um, so some introduction, um, uh, more digging into the social uh, science behind why agriculture insurance we know from the economics literature that risk can have negative welfare implications in two separate ways, and both are really important. One is exposed, this is the one that we most often think about, um, strategies to cope with losses from weather shocks are costly. So people might take out loans, expensive loans, or sell their land in order to cope with losses um, incurred from weather shocks. And this is especially the case for covariate risks, such as droughts or floods, because in that case, existing informal insurance mechanisms, such as people's own savings, maybe informal borrowing, um, helping each other out, it fails because everybody is exposed to the same shocks. In addition, um, even when there's actually no shock occurring, uh, risk can have negative welfare implications because it discourages investments in high productivity, but also high risk um, opportunities. And that also comes with banks being hesitant to finance agriculture and issue loans, as this would expose um, them, the banks, to systemic risks that farmers at large are facing. Um, and um, uh, we know that optimal investment levels will be decreasing in risk aversion. So the more risk averse farmers are, the less they will want to invest in these profitable but high risk opportunities. And they might even say, no, I, even if there's access to loans, they might say, no, I don't want to borrow because the risk of my crops failing or me losing my livestock is too large because I am anticipating the possibility of weather shocks. Um, and so this is why there is so much interest in insurance, because it is seen as a way to ex ante unlock investments in agriculture. Um, but so far, it has been really challenging providing successful insurance programs. On the one hand, indemnity-based insurance, which would pay out for actual losses incurred, this is simply too costly. And there's issues around moral hazard and adverse selection. For instance, somebody with insurance might say, okay, um, let me not invest in preventing um, damage to my crops because then when an adjuster comes out, um, at least when my crop is damaged, I will receive an insurance payout. So there's an incentive problem in adverse selection, meaning that more farmers exposed to relatively more risk will be more likely to enroll. So that is an issue with um, indemnity-based insurance and driving up premiums to such high levels that it's generally inaccessible for smallholder farmers, in particular also because the cost of sending, sending somebody out to verify that losses have indeed occurred is really expensive. Now, index-based insurance was designed to overcome these challenges, but their um, major barriers have been associated with basis risk, meaning that the quality of insurance contracts is low and that insurance might trigger payouts when farmers have actually not suffered losses, or the other way around, which is the main way that we hear about basis risk. Farmers suffer losses, but the insurance product doesn't pay out. And this is closely linked to just 
um, it being very difficult in the absence of good ground data to design these products. Um, and that has resulted in low trust and low demand. So that's a challenge that index-based insurance programs have been facing. So here comes the question now, can we actually use technology to lower the costs of crop monitoring and lower basis risk and maybe even move towards indemnity-based insurance because with technology, we might actually be able to observe from a distance at low cost what is happening on the farms. And so that's where an intervention that IFRI has been working on over the last few years, um, starting in India, came in um, called picture-based insurance. So this innovation is settling claims or insurance on the basis of smartphone images submitted by farmers of their crops throughout the growing season. And the images submitted before any potential damage occurs, they serve to make sure that the farmer was managing the crop adequately prior to any damage. So in order to minimize issues, concerns around moral hazard, and then um, at the, um, uh, any images at the time when damage occurs can help quantify to what extent does this farmer experience losses and determine actual insurance payouts? So in a formative evaluation in Northwest India, um, we found that farmers could and were actually willing to send in, in images of high enough quality for such picture-based loss assessment. And that agronomists, when reviewing these images, were able to identify severe damage from these images, which reduced basis risk compared to more standard index-based insurance approaches. Um, and also we found that picture-based insurance increased the demand for insurance without necessarily introducing effort selection and moral hazard. So then Acre Africa, um, interested in providing insurance in Kenya, reached out to us and said, hey, can we actually replicate this in our context here in Kenya? And as part of that, they wanted to go to a much larger scale than what we have worked at before, which called for the question, how can we scale this approach really necessitating um, the need for automating image processing? So a second question became, can we automate image processing and can we detect damage through machine learning from uh, these images that farmers might be sending in? So a little bit more about the context, Acre recruited and trained a network of champion farmers to distribute insurance and related services. And these champion farmers, they registered um, farmers in their communities. And of them, we randomly selected a number in the shortlist of 20 farmers for whom images would be sent in on a regular basis. These data were collected using a an app that is actually available on the Play Store called See It Grow. Um, for, and that, that app is, is designed for this task, for photo-based crop monitoring throughout the growing season. So, so to really in a systemic way, in a systematic way, to collect ground images of target crops um, from the start of the season to the end of the season with geotags and timestamps and without farmers having an opportunity to tamper with the images, for instance, you know, to apply in Instagram a drought filter and then send that in um, to Acre Africa for insurance payouts. Um, and then in addition, the, the champions were involved in distributing free insurance trials, also trial packs of seeds. And then the champions, the idea is that they will be involved in future marketing of these products, but first generating consumer awareness that these products exist. Um, so as a social scientist, I'm an economist. Um, we do have a randomized trial in place to study the impacts. I won't talk about that in today's talk. I just wanna highlight here that we had 181 champions in total that were sending in images, each of them for around 20 farmers that they had been shortlisting. Um, in the long range 2020, so we're looking at data from two seasons. In the long range season of 2020, that is just after the start of the pandemic, um, we only had champion farmers send in images of their own plots so that we would allow them to practice social distancing. We didn't want them to necess unnecessarily interact with other farmers. Um, but in the short range 2020 and 21 season, we had um, um, PPE in place and allow the champion farmers to also start sending in images for other farmers in their community.
Um, so this resulted, well, let me first um, point out a few quick statistics on what, what do these farmers look like, because there's a strong human element in here. Um, we see that the champion farmers, um, a lot of them, about a third, are actually relatively young. And they are also, on average, a lot younger than other farmers in their community. Um, they are much more likely to have a phone. And I want to flag here um, that um, um, actually um, about only a third of, or less than a third of the other farmers have a smartphone. And so it's actually really important when thinking about digital divides to work through these champions because they can send in images and make sure farmers are included uh, in the insurance program um, because they are the ones who, who have smartphones. Um, this is data at baseline. We equipped all the champions with smartphones after they completed this questionnaire. So right now, champions would all say that they own a smartphone. Um, then um, also interesting to note is that um, among the champions, a lot of them had some experience with insurance. Among other farmers, awareness was a lot lower and um, uh, very few farmers actually had had insurance at baseline. Um, so now turning to the image processing piece, which is the main part that I want to talk about. Um, we see that um, uh, in total, we had um, around, let me minimize this. Um, we, we, so Champion Farmers submitted more than 13,000 maize images um, during these two seasons combined. But for other crops, we had far less images. And so we decided for the machine learning for now to focus on maize. And um, the partner that we are working with on the image processing, VARA eRegistry, um, they will be potentially using transfer learning models combined with additional training data from future seasons to start developing models for green ram and sorghum. Now, the goal for these images um, was to label or was to could develop convolutional neural networks in terms of predicting growth stage. Um, so the crop growth stage, whether there was visible damage due to drought and excessive rainfall, and then also to what extent the crop was damaged. And so in order to train the convolutional neural networks um, to predict these different types of variables, um, agronomists labeled 11, more than 11,000 maize images in terms of these three variables, crop growth stage, um, whether there was visible damage and what the cause of damage was and then what the extent of damage was. Um, so this was on its own a major endeavor and those data are actually going to be published um, in a few weeks from now, um, along with the images for other people to start using this data as well. Um, so as I mentioned, these labeled images were then used to train convolutional neural networks. We had different models for growth stage for the type of damage visible and the extent to which the crop was damaged. Um, and in doing so, 37.5% of images were used as training data, 12.5% were used as validation data, and we kept 50% aside as testing data. Um, now let me turn to the growth stage prediction and share some results and particular challenges that we have encountered, which I think is most interesting for this community. Um, so we were able to predict growth stage as um, a model with four classes with an accuracy of 75%. So that's decent, not perfect. And some of the challenges that we encountered were that in initial classification, um, it was a bit challenging to separate flowering from maturity, especially from early maturity, um, because there were some borderline cases. And examples of those images are shown here in the middle. Now, we then decided to combine flowering and early maturity into one category and have late maturity as a separate category. Uh, but then we ran into issues that in the late maturity stage, um, crops did not always show discolorization of leaves, and that was making it difficult to differentiate between the kind of early maturity versus the late maturity based on color, which is something that it seemed the convolutional neural networks were trying to do, basing on color, determine um, whether something was late maturity versus um, 
uh, flowering versus early maturity. So these two factors in two separate models were kind of the main reason for why the accuracy was not getting above 75%. Now, in the um, in another model, we look at can we predict drought? So we actually have very few vi vi images with visible damage from excessive rainfall, and farmers also didn't report excessive rainfall as a major source of damage in these two seasons. So with our CNNs, convolutional neural nets, we focused on drought. In order to predict, um, first of all, a binary variable, whether a crop was affected by drought, and thereby we used the threshold that there would have to be at least 20% damage as labeled by the agronomists who went through all the images. Um, and in this model, we found an accuracy of 89%. Uh, um, and, and pretty exciting, um, we had around 5% false negatives. Um, and then 6% false positives. Um, sorry, there's a typo there. And this was mainly, mainly driven by the maturity stage. So um, the discoloriza discoloration of, um, of leaves, of the plants, um, during the late maturity stage, the yellow color was sometimes picked up as, dr as drought. And so that led to um, quite a few false negatives and the model not always being able to discriminate um, well between cases. Now, we also had a continuous variable, the extent of dam damage, which was scaled between zero and one, with zeros being no damage and one being 100% damage. Um, and we see here that there was actually a pretty high correlation between the actual label from the agronomist uh, for the extent of damage versus the predicted label um, from the CNN. Um, we found a correlation of 0 0.86. And also if we look at the absolute error here shown um, as a deviation um, between, or the difference, the absolute difference between the actual and predicted label, we see that most um, images are falling in the zero to 10% category, whereby there's at most a 10% absolute uh, difference between the two labels. Um, and very few, um, if we move right in this table, we see very few images falling into larger deviations. Um, I mentioned here that uh, distinguishing drought from maturity was challenging because of the color. Um, and, and then also um, multi-class so yeah, we also try to estimate multi-class damage models, whereby we did not only include drought, but also weed and nutritional deficiencies. Their accuracy was lower, model performance was not as robust. And so here we concluded that we really need more data in order to uh, move towards multi-class damage models, which um, would allow for richer insurance products that do not only pay out on the basis of drought, but also on the basis of other potential natural hazards that farmers might occur in order to further reduce basis risk. Um, so now um, I have a slide with a question that I think Javu also had in mind for the Q&A. Uh, so let me just be brief on this one. Um, uh, so we also look at um, sort of how to make sure that these products are inclusive. And so first of all, we have champions sending in images of insured crops to make sure that farmers without a smartphone also can participate. Um, but what we found is that a challenge is still that not all farmers have their own mobile money account. Um, and they will need a, a mobile money account to receive the payout because this is all done over M-Pesa, the main form of mobile money in, in Kenya. So what if somebody doesn't have a personal account? Now, we elicited farmers' willingness to pay um, for different types of products. And in there, we also ask, okay, what if this product pays out in a mobile money account of your spouse? Or what if this mo product pays out in your savings group? Um, how much are you willing to pay for insurance in that case? And here in this figure, in the first three columns where we show the average willingness to pay for men in the black bar versus women in the blue bar, you see that if they are receiving the payments themselves, um, their willingness to pay is significantly higher than when the payout is going to their spouse's mobile money account. And it is even lower when the payout is going into the savings club account. So this is really telling us that 
We shouldn't only worry about smartphone ownership when thinking about digital divides in insurance products, but also farmers having the financial inclusion and having their personal mobile money accounts in order to really, in order to really value these insurance products. Now, the champions um, are also an important factor in here to make sure that the model is inclusive because the champions can send in images on behalf of other farmers in their community. Um, but this requires some kind of business model. And so um, because of that, we're looking at bundling the insurance product with seeds and the champions receive a commission on the basis of selling seeds in their community. Now, this is actually the added advantage that it increases willingness to pay. Um, so let me turn to the final slide um, and wrap it up here. Um, as I mentioned, is that um, I think the takeaway messages, we see that machine learning can be used to automate drought, to drought detection on the basis of smartphone images. So that's really exciting in terms of moving these digital innovations in agriculture insurance forward. When thinking about a digital divide, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And then in terms of next steps and future analysis, I already pointed out that the data will be published in the near future. Um, and then there's some other things um, uh, that are on our to-do list and agenda for the coming year, um, years to come. But if you have any questions or want to talk more, um, please let me know. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present here. Thanks, awesome. Barbara. Yeah, thanks, Barbara, for a really comprehensive presentation. I, I had some kind of prepared questions that I wanted to ask panelists today. And actually, you 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 addressed many of the digital divide, uh, some of those data issues. So I think it, it was great. Um, uh, I, I don't see any like uh, questions asked by audience yet, uh, but. However, I was looking through who are joining today to, uh, and I found Thresh name and uh, Thresh is on, uh, one of our colleagues at IPRI, uh, also uh, extraordinary professor of the University of Pretoria has been working on this issue for a long time. And, and Thresh also published recently a discussion paper of, about lessons learned uh, from crop insurance programs in India. Um, so I thought, it might be also useful for all of us to hear a little bit of his research finding uh, from the recent study. So uh, Thresh, can you maybe share your uh, video or show us? Your... Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I, great, yes. Yeah, I, I, so just to uh, congratulate uh, our uh, presenters today, you know, excellent uh, set of presentations and um, Murali Krishna and uh, Giriraj Anuruddha and, and Berber. And this is a subject that um, uh, almost 30 years ago, I used to work on and risk aversion of farmers and why farmers don't take risk kind of thing. But then moving fast forward, in the recent years, policymakers in India that I deal with, particularly at the state level, have been struggling with uh, how to implement insurance uh, schemes. I mean, that's where it boils down to all this research that we are doing has to result in action in the policy arena. And, and that's where I work, basically. So the research that you all do is an excellent uh, kind of input, pushing the frontier forward. You know, so I'm very admi admir I, I'm admiring how committed you are to this research. And particularly Berber's research is, 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 is to me, is uh, advancing the, the area where we really have to go. Now, the question that I'm asking broadly is, um, when I deal with the policymakers, they really are struggling with how to use the digital devices and digital images and so on. And even three years ago, when I was in the field, and uh, um, um, our colleagues will know when I talk about uh, Krishi Vidyan Kendras, which are also in the district level extension uh, group uh, in Indian context, uh, are trying to move to uh, the, um, the satellite images as the, along with the rainfall, you know, other, other data that they collect, right? So even in that context, the implementation of insurance programs becomes very difficult. Indian government, by the way, is very committed in terms of allocation of resources, but it's not connecting the technology that we have, the digital devices that we have, and the policy making is not connecting. Maybe it will take some time as Barber, uh, Barber say, was saying that more data comes in, more 
uh, you know, uh, machine learning techniques come in and, and maybe it'll take time. But at the moment, what can we do? That's my question. Can we build some capacity of the local researchers so they can do the kind of work that you are doing? Uh, and how do we, you know, translate this randomized control trial results to policy making? That's a broad question, but then I'm so excited about the research, but I want to know how I can talk now to policymakers with your research. Thank you. Yeah, th yeah. thanks, Suresh. I think that's that's really excellent point. Uh, and also in your paper, you mentioned uh, the farmers don't seem to have kind of trust or, or uh, convinced that process of transparent uh, is really sort of their need. So I think there are a lot to be, um, yeah, more research needs to be done on that adoption and yeah, behavior change and down the stream. So yeah, amongst our panelists, our speakers, Berber, uh, Ani, Murari, and Giraj, uh, do you have any comment on a uh, fresh question, a uh, broad question on how we can bring these digital tools uh, to policymakers and convince them to continue investing in uh, this kind of yeah, processes. So I can quickly kind of bring in two examples of, of how we are trying to achieve this in our work, because indeed it is extremely important. In the context of India, we are working with the Mahalanobis National Crop Forecast Center, MNCFC. Um, um, Murali and his team are also engaged um, with the MNCFC and as part of that we are piloting and testing these new technologies um, for crop loss assessment in the context of India's national insurance scheme and MNCFC is the main technical service provider to the national insurance scheme so they give the government recommendations on which technologies to use for um, loss assessment and claim settlement in the scheme. So that's one type of engagement where there's a very clear technical service provider. In the context of Kenya, um, there's also a national crop insurance scheme. There we are more at um, an initial stage talking to policymakers and looking at on a pilot basis, can we bring some of these technologies into, um, into the program? And so the work that we have done so far without involvement of the government, is providing a more of a proof of concept that now Acre Africa um, can try and engage with the, with the public sector to try and take this to a larger scale. And I think in addition, just working with an organization like Acre Africa, whose bread and butter is providing insurance, is a really important step to bringing you know, this into the real space outside of the research space in a way. Thank you. Hey, good. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, if there are no other um, comments or questions yet, I, I answer. Oh, okay, Giraj. Yeah, I see your hand up. Yeah. Thanks, Jav. I, I think uh, Suresh has uh, um, exactly raised an important mm -hmm. question, but I would also like to say, um, contrast to other regions, uh, India has, uh, has a leapfrog, uh, not just of weather insurance today, they are over two and a half decades doing in crop insurance. Uh, but I would also say that uh, there has been a lot of improvement in terms of uh, digital divide. When we talk today, uh, Airtel and many telecom companies are providing climate services, providing various market related input. There is a, certainly there is a leapfrog on what we see the digital uh, improvement is happening in India. And, but on the other end, if you also say, PMFBY, many of the states are also not happy about the crop insurance because farmers still do see that there is a lot of uh, discomfort in terms of the policy they have developed. Um, and also there is also the states are not happy with that. Um, the reasons are multifold, uh, but I would also see from the farmers like in Bihar, if someone is taking a, a crop insurance, um, they will look at some basic um, weather insurance and they look at the crop cutting experiment. I think uh, Man Office Crop Forecasting Center encourage a lot of crop cutting experiment, but I would also say that that's not only the end goal of that. Uh, they need to really look at if the farmer is getting uh, flood or drought damages in the early season of the um, crop, what is that these uh, centers and the policies are going to help them? Uh, so far it is nil. They have to wait for more than six to seven months or even nine months. So these policies are not certainly helping farmers. So they have to take 
additional capital loan to even uh, recover the crop damages to plant some early season and also there is a lot of complexity still we see uh, farmers understanding and uh, usability of the crop insurance while there is a growth in digital elements etc right but my uh, larger point i just want to say to the uh, questions that were raised by javo uh, i would say that uh, crop insurance is still look like a silo program mm. uh, it is not that uh, ministry of agriculture should only look after this effort i would say that these uh, insurance program should be structured in every adaptation program right. whether it's a watershed development within that any farmers are uh, doing any crop I, there should be more default currently it is all more structured to lending loans and many other complex structure mm -hmm. we need to really simplify this then uh, the question of more usability and adoption and acceptance uh, will come from the farmers so right. those are some observation job okay okay great yeah thanks kiraj uh, just just quickly mrari um we are running out of time but uh, yeah maybe you can also add uh, a few more words to the Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, actually, as you know, uh, what we are producing the products we are circulating to uh, reinsurance insurance companies. They are directly mm -hmm. using our crop stress maps for you know every 15 days we are providing that information. Uh, that is a one of the guide for them, especially to locate uh, you know clusters. Some clusters they are identifying based on our maps. That in, based on that. they are giving recommendations to the farmers that's the reason every 15 days uh, information is very useful for them and another one actually that uh, right now uh, indian crop insurance based on credit linked insurance whoever taking loans from the bank they are the only people taking um, uh, going for crop insurance but right now what we have implemented that research project we are strengthening you know farmer farmer communities so so uh, non loan farmers also coming forward you know actually there was a nearly 4 million uh, 40 million farmers are enrolled in uh, crop insurance throughout india but now non loan farmers nearly uh, even our project sites we are working on uh, two districts only within two districts there was nearly 50000 farmers were enrolled non loan farmers yeah. actually our government the main focusing on non loan farmers Right, so there, there are still yeah a lot more work to be done. Uh, and also yeah, Ani mentioned uh, in his uh, kind of introduction uh, why there are so many Indian <laughs> speakers uh, in this talk. But I, I don't think that's a kind of coincidence. I mean, there are a lot of uh, innovative crop insurance and agriculture insurance work uh, being done, and it's very strong government support. There are a lot of R and D uh, investment going in. So I think a lot can be learned. um from india's example also scaling up to other regions um and countries so uh before we finish today uh today's program I i'd like to ask barber um uh, so i i heard you are uh, kind of developing kind of community of practice uh, around this topic and uh, as we discussed today uh, it's really exciting idea uh, incorporating digital tools uh, yeah, opening up a lot of possibilities but also at the same time there are just so many things uh, quite very complex programs to be developed and for government to support so a lot need to be done uh, from research side and i think uh, the cop uh, community of practice around this topic is really, really important uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about your plan to how we can support this community of practice yes definitely um so yeah just as background for people here um as part of ccafs um so the cgr research program on climate change agriculture food security in the last 3 years um we had um a sort of ongoing community of practice um with different people in the cgir working mm -hmm. on agriculture insurance um and as part of that community of practice um just like in this big data um cop uh we had a few webinars um there were some efforts to um uh you know to learn from one another um and now that the crps um including ccafs are coming to an end and we're entering a new phase um we anticipate that quite a few new insurance initiatives are starting and i think some of the things that were presented today could already be very useful in designing the insurance activities and planning in those new initiatives 
Um, and so I think that, um, yeah, what, what we hope is that sort of this continues, um, that we keep sharing across the CGIR um, uh, insights on what works in insurance. And that also as we're planning insurance activities that we're coming together um, and sharing what we are actually planning and having an opportunity to provide feedback and see if there's room for collaboration. Um, so if people are interested in joining this, um, then please do reach out to me um, because we should be having a meeting sometime in February in which we want to get the group um, together. So those were a few notes on the community of practice for insurance. Thank you, Jamu. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. I'm really looking forward to to see the community of practice uh, developing uh, and, and also sharing these lessons learned uh, across this committee. Great, uh, thanks so much for everyone uh, joining today. Um, despite being very close to the holidays, I think we had uh, excellent presentations and uh, great uh, discussions. So thanks Rash for also joining today, for sharing your um, yeah, experience. So we will be closing today's session uh, a little bit over time and we will be host, uh, posting today's video to YouTube channel, Big Data Platform video channel, so you can see that. And yeah, we also post some of the uh, relevant information we discussed today along um, along with the video post. So we will, uh, yeah, you will see it there and we will be looking forward to seeing you again uh, in like agriculture insurance community of practice activities next year. So thanks everyone uh, and hope you have a uh, great holidays and have some rest and I'll uh, see you next year. I'll see you in 2022. Okay. Bye, and thank everyone. you, Jabu, for hosting. Bye-bye. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for joining today. Uh, thanks for presenting Bye, your work. Um, Murali, uh, Barbara, uh, Ani. Thank you, Jabu. Yeah, and Giraj. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay. you all. Bye. Bye-bye.